So what I'm going to talk about is a pretty simple story. It's we have several projects where we've been monitoring regeneration of pines and other species in red pine stands that are managed with some form of retention harvesting. And so I was going to talk about um, in a couple of projects, experiments in particular, one of which that Rebecca Montgomery, who's here as well, works with us on. To do that, I'm just going to talk a little bit about context of why we even try to do that. And then I'll describe the research projects and then we'll get into some results. So context, what do we know? We know that red pine ecosystems are naturally or were naturally pretty complex in structure. In fact, they were woodlands. They were closed canopy forests. And you see Lane Johnson's poster across the hall. If you haven't looked at that, he has a poster about that issue in there. So something like 50 to 75% canopy cover that was really heterogeneous across space in, in a, what we call a stand. Complex age structures. You can see an example of this of old growth stands we have reconstructed in terms of establishment. Um, not nearly or even closely even aged in most cases. And the key thing there, the commonality is that there was overstory present to some degree during most regeneration. And these typically were kind of large gas scale events, may involve a surface fire, a fire that crowned out and killed a patch, might have been big wind events, might have been our malaria, but overstory present to some level. What, what's the other thing we knew about or know about red pine ecosystems? That they are or were um, mixed species ecosystems. And this is just something that Bud Heinzman did you know, out of the Boundary Waters decades ago, showing that kind of uh, composition. And there's two NPCs from our classification guide. Yes, they're red pine dominated, but look at all those other species in there. When we manage for red pine, typically we sort of push aside those other species. So the last kind of context piece is that our timber focused management approach to red pine is somewhat contrary, oftentimes contrary to what we know of in terms of the natural model. So we tend to manage for single species red pine, even age strictly, um, homogeneous structure. We want to optimize resource availability to all the trees that are in the stand, shorten the rotations. And I would argue that's great, that's fine. It's what we should be doing in the context of timber production. But if you have a different objective, such as managing for structure and composition that's closer to that natural model for an NPC, that's your goal, restoration of it, sustainability of it, then something else might be warranted in terms of the model you use. And that's where I kind of the second thing I'll talk about here comes into play. Really what we're talking about is regeneration systems that have some level of retention of overstory trees at harvest to emulate that natural disturbance dynamic, in particular, in particular the legacy outcomes. Some trees are left behind based on natural disturbance. And in sort of cartoon format, it can play out in a whole bunch of different ways in terms of how you might implement retention. So there isn't one strict way. It can look spatially uh, quite different. And these are just pictures from different studies that we work in uh, where we've done that. So variable retention and harvesting, by definition, is variable in practice. So it can range from large groups to selection, all the way up to something you might think of as an irregular shelter. But so again, the commonality is there is that there's an overstory present during the regeneration event. But we all know if you're a good forester, you can't do that, or you shouldn't be doing that, right? So if you're foresters in the crowd, you know what I'm talking about. We have this issue with shoot blight, um, with other diseases, with concerns about productivity losses in trying to regenerate pine systems with retention. Well, I'm not a good forester or a real forester. So I've ignored that. And over the decades since in my career, we've been pursuing research that does exactly that. So retention uh, experiments, big operational scale stuff um, that involve variable retention harvesting uh, to some degree. And we have a number of them, but I'm going to focus on two, our oldest ones. So we have one on the Chippewa National Forest, established in 2002. Um, largely developed by myself, Rebecca, Peter Reich, and Rebecca continues to work with us on this. And then we have one in the Red Lake Wildlife Management Area that was a couple years older, or younger than that, 2004, that myself and many of you know Doug Kastendick really leads the effort on that. So they're similar in kind of the scope of the objective, but they're different in terms of their condition and their origin. 
species. So the chip study is natural origin post fire. Red Lake is a plantation, differences in age, different um, native plant communities. You see the starting basal areas are a bit different. We'll look at some pictures, cartoon pictures of these treatments here in a second, but they both involve different spatial patterns of retention. So a heavy thinning that we call a dispersed retention after the harvest, then the CHIP study had several gap scale retention approaches where we cut quarter acre or three quarter acre gaps with thinning in between. And that was done once so far in the CHIP. There's a second thinning on the books right now for this study where the dispersed stands will be thinned again, the gaps will be expanded. The um, red light study is similar. There's this dispersed retention, which is a heavy thinning. And then there was a treatment with half acre gaps. And that actually has two, has had two entries in it, two thinnings. So the second one has already occurred. So here's the basal area reduction on the chip. The initial harvest was to 70 square feet. This is stand wide. So even with the gap approach, we're averaging across the stand. And the second cutting, we'll cut it to about 60. And then on Red Lake, it was 90 initially, and then two years ago, this took place, it's down to 40. So there's not a lot left there in terms of uh, that plantation setting. Then regeneration um, on the CHIP study, we're monitoring natural regeneration, we're following it, but the key thing, thing I'll talk about here is we planted red jack and white pine. And then in the uh, Red Lake study, following natural regeneration, they also direct seeded jack pine, eastern white pine, and paper bear after the harvest into that study. And there are some other treatments um, depending on the study. That one is, is important. We'll look at this in a second here. Involved uh, brush, uh, manual brushing, mechanical brushing, uh, mostly hazel, obviously red or raspberry as well in that treatment. Okay, so in kind of cartoon format, these retention treatments look like this. So I, I'm calling it a heavy standard thinning because it was down to 70 in that initial cut. So you might start out here and the initial thinning was there and then the second one it's already happened at Red Lake kind of looks like that. And then this expanding gap, your regular shelter wood approach, you start out with a heavy, heavily stocked stand, it might cut down to here and then the next treatment starts expanding those gaps to the point where they're coalescing, open areas start to coalesce so there's more open than, than gap or than retention. Okay, so that's kind of the context. We'll talk a little bit then about results. I'm just focusing on our regeneration component here. So we'll look at survival and density. This is on the Chippewa forest. These planted pies were planted in the spring of 02, roughly 200 per acre per species. So 600 per acre of the three pines, which you know is kind of low. Most of you probably are in the 800 to, I don't know what, 1,200 range. But recall the objective is restoration of those wood, mixed species woodland communities. So it wasn't just the pines we were interested in. Anyhow, this is probably the most you know kind of interesting result here I'll show you because as you well know, we can't regenerate red pine under contained overstory red pine. But nevertheless, we've done it here. So the way this lays out is this is time, this is the proportion of surviving. This is for red pine. Shrubs ambient was there was no reduction in shrubs uh, in the treatment. And there's the four treatments. Control, dispersed, quarter acre gaps, large, large or three quarter acre gaps. And then the right hand side is the same thing, but the shrubs were reduced. They're not eliminated, but they are, were knocked back significantly and they're still low after 15 years or so. Anyhow, you see the pattern here. Not much survival in red pine in the uncut forest, not surprising. Um, but in terms of um, the cutting patterns, it really doesn't matter which cutting treatment we put in. We've got survival that's, that's increased about maybe 25 to 30 percent after, what, 14 years. But when you combine that with shrub reduction, it makes quite a difference. So you see that average survival bump up to in the 50 percent range, depending on the treatment you're in. The point here is that after 14 years, we have roughly 50 percent survival for planted red pine started out at 70 square feet um, and it's you know higher now it's probably something like 80 or so 85 after the 15 years this is jack pine same kind of graph uh, scenario laid out here so steady decline in survival of jack pine over time it does matter 
when you have shrubs just at their ambient level that you cut, you have increases in survival. If you remove those shrubs, it doesn't really matter anymore in terms of the overstory competition. You know, we tend to think of jack pine as being pretty intolerant for shade competition, but it's much less so than maybe most of you think. Um, so when you remove that shrub layer, the, the uh, survival of jack pine comes out at about you know, 50%, 45% over 15 years. And then there's white pine, east white pine, which really doesn't care where it grows. It's very tolerant competition of any form, whether it be overstory trees or, or any shrub layer. So that's survival. And then what this is showing is density of planted pine at our most recent survey. Um, there's the three species of pine. This is the control treatment, no harvesting. And then this is the large gap, which is really the treatment we focus on, creating that bigger opening with the tension between the openings. Um, and then that's ambry shrubs and reduced shrubs. Uh, so again, red pine doesn't do too well in that setting. That's density after 14 years. But look the way it jumps up. In that large gap treatment, this isn't just in the gaps, it's averaging across the stand. So it's even higher in the gap proper when you combine that with, with shrub reduction. And then you can see the um, jack pine and white pine as well. So we're kind of getting that mixture of pines in that treatment. <laughs> and then this is just looking at the sapling density. So those are all plant seedlings uh, across our whatever size range. So not all of them were at this size yet. And this is just factoring out the uh, saplings, so one to four inch class. The same treatments we're looking at here combining the pines. And the point here is that in this large gap treatment is when we start get, get in, getting into hardwoods into that system, which were a natural component of that woodland mixed pine system on the chip FDM 33A. And you know there's a lot of it in that ambient shrub level and it's reduced probably to a more realistic number in terms of what you might want when you're um, also factoring in some kind of shrub reduction. And you can see what the hardwoods were, so natural components of the system. Okay, so that was the chip study. Turning to the Red Lake study, this is, this is very recent. So we have not published anything on this yet. This is just from our sampling this summer. This is density after a regeneration. It's after a second harvest, so they've been in there twice. These are seedlings, less than an inch DBH, and we just have the dispersed treatment and the gap treatment, and there's the species groups or species, and you see there's just a ton of red pine seedling regeneration. It wasn't direct seeded, so this is natural regeneration, caught a seed crop after that second harvest, and these are little things now they establish after that second harvest. The saplings are probably more telling in terms of what happened over the long term. So these are likely around 2004 origin. Um, this is an inch to four inch or five inch. And there's quite a bit, it's variable, but on average, quite a bit of red pine saplings in that gap treatment there, and then a scattering of other species. And this kind of just shows uh, where those red pine at Red Lake are. Most of them are in the gap proper. They're not establishing in the matrix between the gaps. If some of you know Josh Craigthorpe, there he is. These seedlings, roughly 2004 origin, are you know, eight, nine, 10 feet tall. Okay, just to summarize, the natural disturbance dynamic model for these red pine ecosystems include regeneration that had some overstory present, some level, during the regeneration disturbance event. Varying amount, varying spatial patterns. So regeneration systems that include, include retention and to some degree emulate that model. And that's the whole thing we've been pursuing over, over time with these studies. So such an approach may be appropriate when restoration of structure and composition is your goal. It's not your goal, or it's not the way to do it if you want to grow two by fours with red pine. I get that. But if this is your goal, it may be more appropriate. I know that shoot blights and other health issues and productivity issues are a leg legitimate concern, but you know, essentially what we've been trying to say over the years, and this just re-emphasizes it, is that harvesting to some low level of retention, emphasizing larger openings in particular, seems to allow long-term survival of that new cohort of red pine, while creating multi-cohort structure and mixed species composition. So I got five minutes. That was my plan to have some time if people have questions. I hope they were the openings. 
So in the Chippewa study, we had quarter acre openings in one treatment and three quarter acre in a different. I don't like the quarter acre, they're pretty small, both in terms of that the level of survival of say red pine is about the same, but the growth is greatly reduced in those quarter acre openings. And then the red light study in the plantation, they were half acre initially, now they're expanded quite a bit. Did anyone evaluate how much the floating is? Yeah, I yeah, was waiting for that question. Okay, so I have no doubt, you know, I don't know where's Brian at. I'm sure he, he and others will be saying this. I'm sure you probably, the experts probably could see the floatia in my pictures. And no doubt it's in those seedlings, that cohort of red pine. In the early days, we did evaluate it. So Mike Ostry, some of you may have known, was the North Central Northern Station pathologist. He worked with us on the, in the early days. Anytime we had a red pine seedling that died, we sent it to him and he looked at it and you know, most of the time they had sheep white, usually the podium on it. So there's no doubt that it's there. I've seen it at Red Lake as well. I guess the point is that it appears you can either reduce the um, infection proportion or at least reduce the uh, negative impacts of it by increasing their growth through that large kind of gap-based it's kind of a contradictory term. They're gaps, but with retention um, beside it. So we're not following it anymore. I have no, uh, no doubt that it's there, but the point is that we still have this regeneration curve. Keep that in mind, along with the fact that these are NPCs that were mixed species stands. They weren't 95% red pine, and that's not what the goal is for either of these agencies. Individuals. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on why natural region in the Red Lake has been so successful? Yeah. Yeah, so we did not expect it. So the question was, why do we have so much natural region of red pine in the Red Lake studies? So they're plantations. I don't I think they're all farmland and there's like nothing in the understory for the most part. So there's no competition in there. Uh, these were fall harvests, so there was a little bit of scarification. They went into the winter, so fall to winter. There wasn't any deliberate site prep. Uh, appears that we caught a seed crop that you know we didn't really know about, but it wasn't seeded in, it wasn't direct seeded. So some combination of those things, just luck, I guess, but timing it to seed crop you know, unintentionally. Are you having to bud cap the deer and if so, how many years? Yeah, we bud capped the uh, Chippewa study and it's still being bud capped. Uh, the ones that they breed. I mean, most of them are too, too large. So it was bud capped, you know, pretty extensively, I'd say probably for five or six years. And yeah, you know what? It isn't bud capped anymore. Not now. They're all too tall to worry about it. In the red light study, we, we never bud capped, which is interesting. Again, with all that red pine regeneration, there was nothing done for deer there. Please. Was there any prescribed burns done? On um, so good question, any prescribed burns? Not on the Chippewa study, on the Red Lake study, there were a couple, we had eight replicates of each of those treatments. A couple of them were prescribed burns. And they're included in there. They don't necessarily <coughs> fall out as having more red pine regeneration than the ones that were. Well, what, what's the plan for the residual large diameter pine cluster? So, as I said, the Red Lake study has been harvested a second time, and it's down to a span-wide average of um, 40 square feet, which really isn't a lot. And I think the plan there will probably be uh, you know, designate those as permanent retention. Then maybe, perhaps, we'll think about another harvest there, 10 more years, five years now. The CHIP study is being harvested again next winter most likely and my hope is for them to get it to 60. I'd like it lower but that's about all they're kind of comfortable with. So that one has the potential probably for another entry we get to the point where those residuals would be designated as permanent residuals at that point and really then focus on the new cohort of pines and band them down. Right, yeah, when you talk about, remind me of what your shrub reduction technique was and what the timing was on that. Can yeah. you talk about how that may or may not influence site level and micro site and humidity yeah. and whether or not that has an influence on foliage? Yeah, good point. So our shrub reduction in, was mechanical brush saws. And it was just crews, you know, that went through there. They targeted hazel, raspberry, willow, and 
they weren't supposed to target trees, but they did to some extent. And the timing was in the spring. Um, it should be kind of better if it can be a little bit later into the growing season after they've leafed out. And I, I don't remember how many times we did it. I don't know if there's anyone. Kelly Barrett was here. I think she took off from the chip. You know, probably did it six times. So Kyle and I talked about this earlier. Certainly, I mean, Michael Ostry has always had the belief that the podia is worse because of high humidity. If you open up stands, you're getting rid of shrubs and just dry burning, you know, reduce it. I don't know that it falls out that way in terms of our survival of red pine with shrub reduction or not, but uh, it's a good, I think that's what you were thinking about. Yeah. All right, let's thank Brian.